I think one of the things that is very, very important to me, I don't know how to phrase this in terms of a value, and this certainly comes through in my writing, is making sure that every voice in the room is heard, is acknowledged mm. in some way, even if it's an opposing voice, meaning a voice that doesn't necessarily agree with me or my value system. I still think that there's considerable value in hearing people, just listening to people. All righty, folks, welcome back to Transacting Value, where we're encouraging dialogue from different perspectives to unite over shared values. Our theme for season four is intrinsic values. So what your character is doing when you look yourself in the mirror. And now, for our first mini-series on the show called Broadcasting Value, we're showcasing how storytellers, authors, podcasters even, showcase and put their values into the characters and settings within their stories, plays, products, and brands, and release that out to the world and to their audiences. If you're new to the podcast, welcome. And if you're a continuing listener, welcome back. Today, we're talking our February core values of harmony, kindness, and passion with a man who's reached pretty impressive clout and claim within the screenwriting community specifically, David Matthew Barnes. He's written 15 novels, three collections of poetry, seven short stories, more than 70 stage plays. They've been performed in three languages in 12 different countries. He writes in multiple genres, romance, horror, young adult type things. He's won literary awards, poetry awards, and primarily as coming of age stories is how these characters and, and emotions and perspectives are showcased. So we're going to dive into a little bit of that and a lot of bit about values and character development. Without further ado, folks, I'm Porter. I'm your host, and this is Transacting Value. All right, David Matthew, how you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing? Great, great. I appreciate it. And just for the sake of brevity, can I call you DM? Is that cool? DM is perfect, and it's shorter, so it yeah. works out well. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> All right. Well, so DM, first off, let me say, I really appreciate you taking some time out of your morning, being that you're on the West Coast and giving us an opportunity to just talk. I think you've got so much cool stuff and such an awesome perspective and personality to showcase. Uh, so when you wrote me back and said you'd be interested, I was really excited to get this opportunity. So I just want to open by saying thank you for your time. Now, for all of our listeners and even people that just don't know who you are as an author or as a director, or as a screenwriter, but especially since nobody else can see you right now, let's start with a little relatability. All right. So, you know, in short, who are you? What experiences have shaped your perspective? What do you do? These types of, of things. The floor is yours. Well, thank you for that. I appreciate it. Thank you for the invitation to, to be here. I, I really appreciate that. Who am I? <laughs> you know, at the heart of everything, I think above and all, I'm a storyteller. Mm. And I think just an intrinsic part of who I am, I think it's just the way that I'm wired. I think, you know, I whenever I walk into a room I've never been into before, I'm looking at it, I think, a little bit differently than most people because I might be capturing it in my mind to retell it again on page or on stage or screen or, or so forth. And, I, you know, I'm a creative person. I am fueled by creativity. I am purely, I'm still in touch with that level of imagination that I had as a kid. <laughs> and and I use that to tell stories and to, to share those stories with readers and viewers and so forth. And yeah, I think that at the core of who I am as a storyteller, for sure, as who I am as a person, you know, I come from a sort of humble background, humble beginnings, and I've worked very hard, obviously, to get where I am today and where I'm continuing to go and so forth. I've been a teacher. I've been a storyteller most of my life. I've been uh, many things to many people, as they say. So Sure. Yeah, it makes for an interesting day. <laughs> yeah, I bet it does. An interesting life, as it turns out. I mean, for mm -hmm. as much as you've put on paper, I imagine not all of that is totally 100% made up. It's got to be rooted in some sort oh. of experiences and opportunities and insights or other people's lives, for that matter, right? Yeah. No, I, I mean, sort of a two-part response to that. One is I consider myself a professional eavesdropper. So <laughs> <laughs> whenever I'm in places that I'm hearing interactions between two people or more than two people, you know, so much of what I write and where it comes from comes from observation and it comes from listening and just over time really sort of, you know, fine tuning those skills to sort of, I feel like a story detective, you know, mm -hmm. and stories find me, I find stories, but then the hard part, like you're, you were saying is sort of deciding which of those stories are, if there's potential there to tell a bigger story, if it's the beginning of something bigger. 
Yeah. And I, I'm also a very big reader and I just love story and words and language and the significance of words in all form and what they can do, the power of language and the power of spoken word. I mean, you know, one word to somebody can change their life in a, in a really big way. So I love that. I love exploring that creatively. Yeah, I totally agree with you. And it, I mean, it might be as simple as just, hey, you look nice today. That changes your entire outlook for a day. Or it might be something you read in a book that changes your entire perspective for your life and anything in between. Mm -hmm. But it's mm -hmm. interesting you brought that up because you said earlier, you know, fueled by creativity that you had as a kid or, or your imagination and ability to interpret that. And I think that level of literacy and competency, I guess, as a capability is diminishing. You know, it's not, at least in public discourse, you don't talk about as much anymore, you know, like in schools. So my son, he's eight for example. So in elementary schools, and for anybody listening, I'm talking primarily to the United States and no specific curriculum, but in schools, the focus is get the right answer. The focus isn't the process and the interpretation and the poetic license and the socialization and, you know, how to interpret what's happening around you. Or like you brought up earlier, how to creatively do something with that if there's a potential to tell a bigger story. Have you found in your experience over the last few decades, that that's been a changing assessment of yours as well? Definitely. I feel like there's less and less reverence for creativity. And again, we're speaking about Western culture, yeah. <laughs> probably, but for sure, I see it. You know, I've experienced it as a teacher, the shift of the archetypal students that I've worked with, that there is sort of this less and less focus occurring on the imagination the encouragement of new and creative, innovative ideas. And that is concerning to me for sure because so much of that demand or that sort of filling in the gaps of that, if you will, is going to rest on the shoulders of parents and other people in the community to sort of fill in those gaps a little bit. Now, I do feel very strongly that teachers in this country have an extraordinary <laughs> battle every day, you know, in and out of classrooms in terms of budgets, in terms of resources, in terms of funding, in terms of not enough teachers. And so there's that piece too. I will say from my own personal experience, though, I do see the shift. For example, when I was growing up, I grew up with, you know, primarily a single mom for most of my life. And so a lot of that creativity and imagination and so forth, I found in other places. And for example, the local library and libraries in this country are shutting down, you know. So I think that a lot of the things that I had that were beneficial to me growing up with not a lot of resources, immediate resources that I was getting from other places, to your point, are diminishing considerably. So what is that? What is that impact on culture and literacy and so forth and the writers behind me? that are coming up, you know, so they're going to have less to work with to get started. And does it put them at, a, at an unfair advantage, disadvantage? Oh, come on, DM. AI is going to take care of all the initial prompts. You don't have to. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, yeah, I can write a great story about AI, but I don't know if I want it to be a part of my everyday life, just me personally. But <laughs> right, right. You know, we we're, we we're talking about this this morning while we were eating breakfast here about how the sort of spiritual impact on how you interpret society, you know, your, your values, your morals, your ability to make decisions, that type of aspect, because it's not a focus, the more that it gets overlooked, like you just brought up, the less likely creativity and in its interpretation is going to continue to exist and have legs to sort of perpetuate itself. Alrighty, folks, sit tight. And we'll be right back on transacting value. In business and in life, sooner or later, we all hit a wall, a plateau. The Action Catalyst podcast is designed for this moment. Rated a top podcast by Inc. Entrepreneur, Business Insider, and more. Ignite your inspiration today at theactioncatalyst.com or wherever you listen to podcasts. The sort of spiritual impact on how you interpret society, you know, your, your values, your morals, your ability to make decisions, that type of aspect. Because it's not a focus, the more that it gets overlooked, like you just brought up, the less likely creativity in its interpretation is going to continue to exist and have legs to sort of perpetuate itself. And so I'm curious, in your experience, in your perspective, let's dive into your personal values a little bit. So this is a segment of the show called Developing, Developing Character. Character. Developing, Developing Character. character. Mm -hmm. And 
You can answer these three questions to whatever depth and vulnerability you're comfortable with. And for the record, and for anybody listening, if you decide, DM, to answer with, I'm not sure. I haven't really thought about it. That's totally cool, too. Okay. But okay, so three questions. First question, when you were a teenager growing up, what were some of your personal values? That's an interesting question. So growing up as a teenager, I was I really wanted to experience life as much as I could at a very high level, meaning... I, you know, the thrill, the fun, the adventure and so forth. In terms of my values, I think that during those years in particular, those values were shaping my formative years, if you will. But so much of my values growing up, you know, there weren't a lot of kids like me necessarily that were expressive and creative and other things that were part of my core being and looking for that representation of self to look at role models, to create those values, that value system that I was trying to shape and form was tough. And I think that later in life, that's probably why I ended up writing so much for young people. And I, I shared with you before, I think it bears worth repeating here, is that a great question was posed to me many years later after the fact that I was a teenager. And it was a very reflective question for me is, do you write for young people to write for young people? Or do you write for your younger self? And going back to that era when I was really shaping who I was in terms of a moral code and ethic code, I am writing for that younger self. I'm writing the books that I didn't have. I'm writing the screenplays and the stage plays that I needed as a young person to shape and define those. And it's, I think it's difficult. You know, I don't want to sound overly negative, but I wouldn't want to be a young person today for anything considering what's happening in the state of the world, technology, communication styles and skills and so forth. But you know, I think so often that we're usually a reflection of those that are around us, those people that we spend the most time with. And I was really aware, keenly aware of that at a young age of looking at the adults around me, not so much to mirror after, but this is what I don't want to do. So yeah. I think that there was, there was value there too. And for some reason, I was a student enough at a very young age to notice that and to distinguish that and say, okay, that works for them or it's not working for them. And this is why. But you know, I think some of the key things you were talking about earlier, harmony and compassion and kindness, all three of those core values have been part of my life and who I am for many years. I think that those three things really sort of encapture my creative spirit that I have because it comes from all of those places or wanting to create all of those places or, or speak to those three different values. Sure. Well, I mean, if that's sort of where you came from, then let me just roll into question two. Yeah. What would you say are some of your maybe primary values that you try to embody now? I think one of the things that is very, very important to me, I don't know how to phrase this in terms of a value, and this certainly comes through in my writing, is making sure that every voice in the room is heard, is acknowledged mm -hmm. in some way, even if it's an opposing voice, meaning a voice that doesn't necessarily agree with me or my value system. I still think that there's considerable value in hearing people, just listening to people. For me, it's very important to recognize what each person contributes, brings to the table, that there's something that in their experience that can contribute to uh, whatever scenario is happening at the moment. And I think, too, I think one of the hardest things that I struggle with, quite honestly, is trust, mm. <laughs> Which, you know, trusting people. I think when, you, when you're in the industry that I'm in, you have to keep your quote unquote ride or dies very close to you. Because, you know, you meet a lot of people that have agenda and, and so forth. And, you know, how can you benefit their career? And I think this probably just happens no matter what industry you're in, really. But in mine, it feels like a little bit more prevalent a lot of times. So I'm over the years, I've become more guarded. I used to be much more open and trusting and like, hey, I'm best friends with everyone. And now I think just having gone through, I'm going into like my fourth decade as a writer. So I think that somewhere along the line, I've learned some valuable lessons just about not letting those in quickly. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I yeah. Don't know if I said it the right way, but. yeah, sure. I mean, the consideration, the fairness, the, I guess you could call it equality in terms of everybody having a fair opportunity to voice their opinion. I mean, those are all, which honestly sounds very ideal, right? But I don't know if it's always achievable because of a lot of different factors and issues that, you know, equality, equity, inclusion, and diversity are all very, very huge parts of who I am and what I write, obviously. And I aim for that always for those experiences so the people around me, including readers, to have that shared experience, mm. but it doesn't always happen. And I think you have to be okay with it not always happening because the intention is there. 
Well, I suppose it can't always happen. You know, not to say that you can't <laughs> please everybody, right? But there's only so much time right. and capacity and opportunity. And sometimes there's other factors that dictate, I don't know, how many opinions can be heard in any given conversation too. So, yeah, I, I think there's a little sort of grounding there that has to be established. But yeah, I mean, they're called ideals for a reason, you know? Mm-hmm. They're not called actuals. So, mm-hmm. uh, so let me ask you this third question though. How do you see any of your values changing over, let's say, the next 20 years? You know, I think I'm in that place right now, honestly. I feel like I'm so keenly aware of, like, I'm questioning a lot more of my value system, I think, than I ever have in my life. And I don't know if it's because I'm in, like, clearly the second half of my life at this point. But also, too, I think I've just gotten to this very reflective place. The pandemic, I think, certainly had a a big thing to do with that for me. I I know a lot of us spent a lot of time looking within during the pandemic to kind of question who we are, what we want to do, and next steps, and what's working where i think you know like so many people i know change jobs and careers and everything sort of coming into some strange post-pandemic life and that was certainly my case too i looked within a lot and that's to your question i do feel like separate from the creative so much of what i used to do was always sort of centered around who i was as a writer and now secondary i'm sort of like okay who am i when i'm not a writer and so i think having those two sort of separate identities the one sort of more public persona versus more like who I am intrinsically. I think that's the, that's where I've been sort of stuck at and looking at a lot in terms of like, are those two value systems the same, you know? And so representing a value system through writing and culture and creativity, which is certainly a part of who I am, but is that who I am at home? <laughs> so right. I don't know if that makes any sense, but yeah, that's certainly that duality, that duality of like, are they one and the same? Certainly it's been an interesting exploration for me i'm still in it <laughs> I was, i'm sure for anybody or everybody yeah respective yeah. to whatever time it happens but you brought up a good point over the last couple of years and i think it's fair to say globally a lot of people took time to be able to think about themselves already folks sit tight and we'll be right back on transacting value Did you know that children who do chores to earn their allowance have more respect for finance and more of a drive for financial independence? Did you know that families who complete tasks together have stronger bonds? Did you know that cognition, sense of self, and anxiety all improve if people have regular interactions with nature? Imagine what instilling self-esteem, resilience, family, teamwork, and an authorized sense of self could do for the growth of each generation, no matter the temptation. At Hoof and Clucker Farm, that's just another Tuesday. Want to learn how to homestead or just more effectively develop your character for an unknown future? Follow or direct message on Instagram at Hoof and Clucker Farm. Watch it happen in real time. A wise man learns from the mistakes of others. A foolish man learns from his own. You brought up a good point. Over the last couple years, and I think it's fair to say globally, a lot of people took time to be able to think about themselves because there weren't any other distractions. You didn't have a choice. You couldn't even go outside your bedroom in some places, you know? So it was a limiting feature. It was a boundary that I think people had to work through. But now, now we're coming back together. I don't want to say globally or economically, but just socially within our respective zones. And so then sort of like the point you brought up the other day when we were talking about how, you know, you're, you're sort of almost forced now to either question or define or redefine or defend who you want to be, who you want to portray yourself as in society or to yourself, or it was like a reset for everybody, you know, intentionally or otherwise. But to that point, creatives like yourself, influencers in the respective fields, I mean, that's the whole point of arts and humanities, right? Like taking your perspective to interpret whatever's actually happening and then Ultimately, like the role you're filling now could be minimal in terms of a microcosm of arts over thousands of years, but your impact as an interpreter of culture, as a creative person and storyteller is huge. I mean, we, people still read Socrates and Plato and Homer now, thousands of years later, and they were just storytellers of their time too. You know, so I, I think your impact is maybe a little understated, right? Even with a lot of these awards and things, it's almost tough to say understated, but 
to what you've accomplished, you know, your, your impact, I think, could be a lot further reaching, especially given your age group, your audience age group, I mean. Yeah, I agree. I feel, you know, I think sometimes as artists, we feel this, at least I do, feel this very sort of deep set responsibility for the content that we're creating and producing and putting out into the world. And where does it fit in? What conversation is it contributing to? Sometimes it's just pure entertainment, let's be honest. And <laughs> there's certainly a need and room for that. And, and not everything has to be highbrow and sort of, you know, sociopolitical in its yeah. approach or commentary. Yeah. But, and I certainly have those books too that are just nothing but pure entertainment. And I own those and claim them um, proudly. But I do, I do feel like a couple of things come to mind. Is one is that sort of that responsibility of, of the content that we're contributing and having that platform that I'm very fortunate and other writers are very, artists are very fortunate to have that I have those channels to put out content that would impact global culture, global conversations, and so forth, is not something that I should think should be taken lightly. I mean, no matter even if you only just write one book in your lifetime, like you're saying that one book, you know, with artists, when we create something and we put it out into the world, it really no longer belongs to us. It belongs to the person who's reading it or viewing it or experiencing it. And they're going to take it and interpret it and apply it to their own value system and their own experiences and so forth. And you're a part of that, but you're not there. And so it's interesting that you're having impact, like you were saying, through the expression of self in some form, whether it's a novel or a book or a screenplay or stage play. And somebody who watches it or experiences it or so forth has a transformative experience. You never know that you were a part of that transformative <laughs> unless I reach out to you and tell you so. But it's, it is very interesting. I also feel too that going back to those, the reason why we, I think we still read Shakespeare and Jane Austen and all of those great Greek philosophers you mentioned is because like most artists do, is they were trying to make sense of their society at the time and comment on it and sort of put into words that a lot of people aren't able to do and sort of articulate the human experience. What happened, I think, and the reason why we read so much of that stuff or refer to it, is that they really tapped into the universality of those things that are still relevant today as people that we experience in this world, just day to day of, you know, getting up and noticing the world. You know, I mean, and it's just, I think it's all of it's there to just kind of teach us and guide us and to make us take pause when needed. This morning when I woke up, I was, I have a kitchen window that looks out of my backyard and there were two birds just sitting there in the sunshine and they were just kind of like looking all blissful and full of joy of just literally just sitting there and soaking up the morning sun. And it literally made me take pause because it was like, the birds know more than I do. <laughs> they're, they're smart enough just to be like, you know what? All we need is some sunshine and we're happy and we're good. And that's all we need to, to be to be in a place of bliss. And it was such a telling moment for me of like, you know, going and going and going and doing the professional career thing. And then like literally like, oh, let me just stop and just acknowledge the fact that there's sunshine today. <laughs> you know, so it might sound a little corny, but it's just, you know, I think that artists, we, we have to be aware of those moments those take pause moments that are reflective, but there's something in there. And then we have to write about them or draw them or paint them or film them and then share them with people so that they are aware. It's just really like, we're just here to make people aware. <laughs> like, at the end of the day, what is your job as an artist? Make people aware of what's within other people to look within, like certainly artists have done for me. All right, folks, sit tight. And we'll be right back on Transacting Value. Thomas Jefferson wrote in a letter to George Washington in 1787 that agriculture is our wisest pursuit because it will, in the end, contribute most to wealth, good morals, and happiness. Did you know that even at a nearly $1 billion valuation, farmers markets nationwide still authentically serve their local markets as direct-to-consumer, farm-fresh models of freedom, self-reliance, and teamwork? At the Keystone Farmers Market in Odessa, Florida, those same ideals also cultivate an agritourism experience, preserving the old ways of wholesome, family-oriented, sustainable growth of produce and people. For premium quality produce at affordable prices, opportunities for the kiddos to feed the baby cows, or to simply wander the garden and watch your future meals grow, visit Keystone Farmers Market on Facebook or come by in person to 12615 Tarbon Springs Road. Keystone Farmers Market, the place with the boiled peanuts. The end of the day what is your job as an artist make people aware of what's within other people to look within like certainly artists have done for me 
and so forth. And there's, I think, an understated beauty to public service announcements, but in your specific application, it's really impressive to me, especially for writers, to be able to convey and reach out to so many different people and capitalize on the ability of each individual person to interpret what you write differently. But you write it in a way that everybody could get something out of it. It's relatable. You know, it sort of, well, like you said, capitalizes on a powerful moment that somebody can relate to. There's a book called The Storyteller's Secret by Carmine Gallo. Have you heard of it? I've heard of it. I, I have to be honest, I've not read it, but I have heard of it. Well, it's a secret. Now, in the book, one of the chapters he brings up basically is about simplicity for the storyteller to be able to refine and refine and refine until you've identified that moment, right? And I think he says something to the effect of if you can't write it on the back of an envelope, then it's trash because it's too vague. It's too ambiguous and it wouldn't likely have as powerful of an impact. And so I'm curious when you take, as I assume most storytellers or authors or writers do, pieces of your experience through life and your interpretation of it and inject them into your characters, you can sort of see over the course of what, almost a hundred written pieces of artwork you've put together, mm -hmm. a common trend that they're yours. <laughs> yeah. You know, because there's a, I mean, a style obviously and topics and an audience, but like pieces of you in your character arcs. And so how do you align your values and your perspective with the work you create? Mm. That's such a great question. I think when you were asking that, I, my immediate I thought of like, how much of my value system do I share with my characters? <laughs> so, wow. You know, it's like the characters that I create on page and are they just a reflection or a different version of my own value system and traditional sort of who I am as, as a person? But I feel like everything that I write is definitely parts of myself, my very complex self. And I think that every character certainly is, you know, obviously different versions of who I am in some capacity or something that I've observed or absorbed. Sometimes those two characters are versions of people that I know in some way, somehow they're in, in that story and they're present on the page. They're taking up that place because I want them there. But I do feel like writing for me has certainly been very explorative in the sense that I've gotten to know myself better mm. by writing and creating different works of art because when I create, when I'm in that creative space, I'm not thinking about judgment. I'm not thinking about society or fitting in or what's accepted and what's the, I'm thinking about the world and that, that I'm creating imaginatively and like what works in that world. Certainly, if you were to look at the everything I've written, there are some common themes, there are some common values, there are some common, you know, there's trends there. And I don't know if anyone's ever done that with my work, and I <laughs> they do. I don't know if I want to actually talk about it because it might be scary. But, you know, I certainly, I, there's a lot of grief in my work. There's a lot of overcoming of grief. I write about ordinary people experiencing extraordinary circumstances and how those circumstances change them and their value system and who they are and how they experience life thereafter. And that's really at the core of everything I write. But, you know, I write very sort of stuff that I feel is very rooted in realism. So I'm not, I don't write a lot of like fantasy or sci-fi and so forth. Even my horror stuff is pretty rooted in realism, which isn't really hard to do these days, let's be honest. But, sure. but I do feel collectively my body of work speaks to who I am, really. It speaks to the experiences that I've had, both as a young person, as an adult, as a student, as the son of a single mother, as a brother, you know, as a husband, as all the things that I am to people in this world. There are parts of those experiences, certainly, in my work. Now, I will tell you, though, and I think any writer would say this, that there are certain areas of my life that will probably never show up in my work because it's just, quote unquote, too close to home. And I think the creative person, you know, if it scares you to write it, that's the stuff honestly you should be writing. But sometimes I follow that and sometimes I'm like, eh, I can't do that quite yet. So, and I think some stories I think I'll never share and never tell just because that's well, something you have to keep for yourself. Yeah, it's personal. <laughs> right? yeah. yeah, for sure. Yeah, sure. I really appreciate the opportunity to, to dive into this and, and your willingness to be a little bit more vulnerable and open up in, you know, maybe a format that's not really typically your comfort zone. So 
saying that though, I do have one other question for you before we close this out though. As you try to develop, let's say a better you now mm-hmm. that a future you could look back on and be like, yeah, I did that. I'm proud that went that way. I, I learned a lot. I grew from that. That was a good decision, you know, whatever that the future you can look back on and be proud of. How do you work that direction now? I mean, even in your, you know, forties or from your thirties or, or whatever, you're still technically coming of age. It's just a new decade, <laughs> you know, still got to grow and adjust. Yeah. So what have you learned? How do you apply those things now to be a better you? It's so interesting that you asked that because I'm at the peak of that experience. I think right now, I think a lot of people are, as we were talking about earlier, but Mm -hmm. for me, I feel like wanting to be the best version of myself, including living my best life in whatever that means for me, right? I feel like it's so, in so many ways, it is far greater significance in my life than the writing. All right, folks, sit tight and we'll be right back on Transacting Value. Alrighty, folks, here at Transacting Value, we write and produce all the material for our podcast in-house, gain perspective alongside you, our listeners, and exchange vulnerability and dialogue with our contributors every Monday morning. But for distribution, Buzzsprout's a platform to use. You want to know how popular you are in Europe or how Apple is a preferred platform to stream your interviews? Buzzsprout can do that. You want to stream on multiple players through an RSS or custom feed, or even have references and resources to take your podcast professionalism? authenticity, and presence to a wider audience, Buzzsprout can do that too. Here's how. Start with some gear that you already have in a quiet space. If you want to upgrade, Buzzsprout has tons of guides to help you find the right equipment at the right price. Buzzsprout gets your show listed in every major podcast platform. You'll get a great looking podcast website, audio players that you can drop into other websites, detailed analytics to see how people are listening, tools to promote your episodes, and more. Podcasting isn't hard when you have the right partners. The team at Buzzsprout is passionate about helping you succeed. Join over 100,000 podcasters already using Buzzsprout to get their message out to the world. Plus, following the link in the show notes lets Buzzsprout know we sent you, gets you a $20 credit if you sign up for a paid plan, and helps support our show. You want more value for your values? Buzzsprout can do that too. For me, I feel like wanting to be the best version of myself, including living my best life in whatever that means for me, right? I feel like it's so, in so many ways, it is far greater significance in my life than the writing, quite honestly. I mean, the writing has defined me for many, many, many years and will continue to do so. It's, you know, after I'm gone, it's probably, if I'm remembered for anything, it'll be the writing, right? For sure. Hopefully it'll be remembered for the way that I treated people and how people felt, you know, that I made people feel in a good way. But what you're talking about, I feel like, is like personal evolution and like those many different stages of personal evolution, but recognizing that you're in the middle of an evolution, that who I'm going to be in five years might not be, you know, exactly who I am today. But I'm so open to letting those values shift and change and evolve and deepen or all the things that they need to do to get me to that next place in terms of enlightenment, in terms of who I'm going to be five or 10 years from now. But I do feel like looking back at the experiences and choices, both bad and good, that have been made personally, professionally, that have gotten me here. I look at them, I, even the like sort of stuff that quote unquote you might regret a little bit. I look at everything as lessons. I really feel like I'm such a lifelong learner that I always like look at things that like, oh, that was a learned teachable moment for myself kind of thing. Uh-huh. And I think being aware that those teachable moments are there for a reason and that's to get us to a better version of who we are or who we can be. I think sometimes we are, we're not even aware of our own potential. I think that we go through the day to day and we get by. And we do the things that we need to do. We have to be many things to many people. And we check off all those things on a list. But at the end of the day, when you look at self and who you are to yourself, that's the most important relationship you're ever going to have. And I think that that's the one that you need to nurture the most. That's just, I know that might sound a little selfish, but but it's, you know, I think it's really important that at the end of the day, it's, you know, who you are who you are, who you want to be, who you are, the relationship you have with yourself, I think is far more critical. 
And I think that that relationship with myself has really helped me be more informed about the energy that I output, the people that we were talking about earlier that I let in, because you have to have some sort of criteria Mm. for yourself of what is and is not acceptable. And I think that knowing those things and applying them really can only come from a place of growth and personal evolution. Yeah. Well, you've got to have a metric of some kind. You know, do. witting, do. unwitting. And metric is the name of my favorite band. So I, really, <laughs> <laughs> I like that a lot. I'm going to write that down. You have to have a metric. So sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's it's fine. Make it a sticker and then mail it to me. I'll give you my address. I'll use it. <laughs> but But you need to, right? Here's a case in point. A little bit more close to home to podcasters for anybody listening and, and just from my perspective, two cents real quick, that even in the podcasting community, especially as an independent podcaster, right, a host or a producer or a writer, whatever role any of us fill, but in the podcasting community, it's super easy to get sucked in on social media, let's say, or on Spotify or whatever your distribution platform is. I don't know. Joe Rogan's got X amount of zeros and commas worth of fans, Gary Vaynerchuk, you know, Jordan Peterson, any of these people as podcasters that have X amount of fame, a YouTube video, a million plus views. Okay, cool. If you look at that, in my opinion, and you say, well, I've got 200, I've got a thousand, I've got 20, whatever. Mm -hmm. And you try to compare the two, you can't, you're in different leagues. But Mm -hmm. more importantly, I talked to a lady named Ari during season three back in the fall. And she brought up a point to me that resonated a lot that you can look at those videos, you can look at those people, those podcasters, whatever accounts and profiles and see that they've got millions of followers, but there's billions of people in the world. So if that's your niche and that's what you want to accomplish and that's your passion and you're able to sort of harmonize that with your skill set and capabilities, well then whatever they've done to work for the million or the 1.5 million or whatever number obviously hasn't worked for the other 7 billion. So there's still a way that your potential could fill the 6 billion views, right? So you can't even measure to the process. You take what might work and then you evolve and you grow as you go. I think Mm -hmm. a lot in parallel to the character arcs in your stories or in your plays. Mm -hmm. You know, even if what you're trying to exemplify is, is that moment and what you're trying to broadcast is the value and the power within that for people to relate to it, there still has to be a development and growth for every one of your characters in every story, right? Absolutely, because I think that a good story covers that arc. So like for me, it's always like, you know, the character in the beginning of the story is here and they're going to get here. But that journey is the interesting thing. And that journey is usually the thing that people who read my work or watch my films or plays, so forth, that's the thing that they connect with. That's the thing that they reach out to me about the most is that the journey of the character. So I do feel like a representation, again, matters in that regard. All righty, folks, sit tight. We'll be right back on Transacting Value. Legacy means a lot of things. It's integrity, security, building something that outlasts yourself. On Let's Talk Legacy, we explore how experts, well-known names, and others share the way they're leaving more than just memories. What legacy are you leaving? Listen at letstalklegacypod.com. That's the thing that they connect to. That's the thing that they reach out to me about the most is that the journey of the character. So I do feel like a representation, again, matters in that regard. Yeah. That's a powerful point. I I think the awareness... So the first thing you said when we got into this conversation, the ability to observe and interpret, you know, makes all the difference because mm-hmm. nobody's got a right answer. You know, and probably a conversation for another time, but, you know, all of that looking within, I don't know where the storytelling comes from. Mm. <laughs> it's a very strange experience in this world to grow up as a storyteller, to live as a storyteller, to be, it's my professional career now. It's so much a part of who I am, but it's not like, you know, I can go to Ancestry.com. <laughs> Where does the creativity come from? So it's so interesting like that some people are storytellers in our culture. And how and why, we don't always know. But somewhere along the line, that was fostered in them. That was encouraged. Whether it was just themselves encouraging it, which is a lot of times the case, or that others around them and teachers and librarians, all the people we've talked about today, have done that encouragement. But it's so interesting for me. It's like, why me? <laughs> like, why, why am I having this 
life as they, I mean, I'm so grateful for it. I don't want to come across like, because I'm very incredibly blessed and grateful to do what I get to do every day. But then that there's people who want to hear my stories. That's a subject for another time for sure. But it's so fascinating to me of like, you know, is it a gift? Is it a curse? <laughs> is it both of those things? But it's interesting of like who we all are in the world that we all have sort of a place. And my place for this lifetime has been as a storyteller. And I trip up on that a little bit. <laughs> like, why am I the storyteller? In this? But, uh, you know, that's who I am and that's who I will continue to be. Yeah, but those are the people that history looks to, to teach for the sure, future. For sure, for sure. You know, your, yeah. your ability to objectively <laughs> interpret and express humanity is going to dictate yeah. overall generational progress not to sound hyperbolic but yeah that's how it goes like it. you know and i'd love to talk more about it and dive more into well actually a lot of stuff and maybe we can just do that in the future and have you back on but for now for the time being if people want to reach out to you if they want to check out your work your books your screenplays or just get in touch and reach out what are some ways people can do that so I'm, i recommend going to my website which is www d matthew b and that's d m a t t h e w b dot com d matthew b dot com all of my information is there i'm also on social media and i you know people reach out to me for various reasons and i don't mind that at all i consider myself to be very approachable and so many people have helped me and supported my work and so if there's a way that i can help somebody else to support their work i'm always happy to do that but yeah, that's probably the best way is DMATHUB or through or through my website, DMATHUB.com or through social media. If I'm in the middle of uh, writing, sort of <laughs> reaching a deadline, I usually I take a little bit of hiatus from social media sometimes to get that work done and focus on what I got to get done. But I'll check it eventually. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> sure. Perfect. Well, for everybody listening, uh, we'll have links to DM's uh, website and social media to be able to reach out. All that will be in the show notes. But saying that, DM, I really appreciate the opportunity, man. This was this was a cool conversation, super cool perspective, and something that I've been interested in trying to talk about. So I'm glad we finally had the opportunity. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you a lot. I really appreciate it. It was a fantastic uh, conversation. Yeah, that was good. And again, in the future, if you're interested, let me know and we'll have you back on. For everybody else, though, I appreciate you tuning in and listening to our core values for February of harmony, kindness, and passion. I'd also like to thank Carmine Gallo and everybody in DM's life that's contributed to his perspective and his ability to write and help foster his creativity. Because honestly, without you guys and your influence and your input, this conversation would have gone drastically different. So, <laughs> so I, I want to say thank you to all of you people as well. To our show partners, Keystone Farmers Market, Hoof and Clucker Farms, and Buzzsprout, obviously, for your distribution. Thank you. Now, folks, if you're interested in joining our conversation or you want to discover our other interviews, check out transactingvaluepodcast.com. You can follow along on our social media where we continue to stream new interviews every Monday at 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on all your favorite podcasting platforms. And until next time, that was Transacting Value.